Okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon's book launch. Uh, we're here to celebrate the publication of John O'Regan's wonderful and learned new book, Global English and Political Economy. Um, my name is John Gray, and I'm the uh, co-director of the UCL Centre for Applied Linguistics. And I'm just going to run through the format for the, the book launch. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand over to Li Wei if he arrives. Li Wei is the um, director and dean of uh, UCL Institute of Education. He's in another meeting at the moment, so if he's a little bit late, um, uh, I'll do it the other way around. And I'll okay. hand over to um, David Block, our old friend and colleague. Um, David is the ICREA uh, Professor of Sociolinguistics at the University of Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona, and he's also the editor of the Routledge Language, Society and Political Economy series um, within which uh, John's book uh, sits. Um, so after we've heard from Li Wei and we've heard from, from, from David, then I'm going to start the ball rolling really um, by asking John some questions really about the book so that he can tell us a little bit about um, what it's about and the major themes of that book. And then after we've done that for about 15 minutes or so, um, we'll hand over to you and you can ask John questions or you can respond to some of the comments that, that have been made. Now we're going to use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. So if you could put your questions there or if you'd rather speak directly to John, you can raise your hand and speak um, directly and ask your question directly to him. Um, we've got uh, Peter Browning and Katie Hyatt here um, to help out if there are any technical problems, and we're very grateful them, very grateful to them for for being here to to help us out. Um, so, without um, any any further delay, given that we've only got an hour, um, I'm going to hand over to Professor Lee Wei, who is the director and dean of UCL Institute of Education, to say a few words. Hi, I'm, I am here, but you can't see me because uh, you need to enable my video as host because <laughs> I'm not, I can't uh, switch my video on. Ah, oh, that's, that's interesting. Was, yeah. yeah, but you can hear me. We can hear you clearly, Li Wei. Yeah, I can't uh, switch my video on for some reason. I, it says it has to be the host who um, will switch me on. Um. And, Anyway, I'm just going to, given the time, I'm just going to go ahead and um, say what I have to say, okay? So okay. the author whose work we're celebrating, John O'Regan, is Professor of Critical Applied Linguistics here at UCL. I'm mentioning his title because the book we're discussing today is, in my view, an example of the best scholarship in critical applied linguistics. In fact, I'd say it defines what critical applied linguistics is all about. The scope and depth of knowledge covered in this book is absolutely amazing. Now, if you have read uh, the reference list, I'm sure you'll be as impressed as I am, deeply impressed with the range of literature John uh, reads and uses in this book. The reference list uh, alone is worth every penny you spent on uh, <laughs> buying the book. So, uh, and you'll hear more of the contents of the book later, so I won't comment on, on them now. The book is a product of many years of real research and critical thinking. I'm really pleased that it's getting the attention it's receiving now. So my warmest congratulations to you, John, and thank you for giving us so much food for, uh, for thought. So I'll pass it over to David, who will yeah. uh, make more detailed comments. Okay. Thank okay, thank you very much, Li Wei. Good to see you again as well. You're on the screen now, so finally, I had the same problem. Uh, okay, um, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll be very, very brief here. Um, I'm speaking as the editor of the series, uh, Language, Society and Political Economy for Routledge. And um, I'm, I'm delighted this book has been published because um, it, it combines several, several issues. First of all, like the other books in the series, it, it 
kind of it, it conforms to what I had in mind when the when the book series started several years ago, and that was, you know, just very briefly three points to bring political economy into applied linguistics or into sociolinguistics. We could also add. Um, there's also I was interested in in books that had a, a heavy load of theory, but of course without you know boring the reader, but. Uh, to, to have a lot of theory and then relate it to either practical examples or, or, or shall we say real world examples. And I think all the books so far have done that. And I was also interested in interdisciplinarity that, that there was, you know, I think that kind of comes with the territory if you're combining, if you're bringing political economy into um, applied linguistics and, uh, and also somewhat non-mainstream. I had that in mind as well, that these are books that, that uh, kind of stick out a little bit, you know, with compared to other books, but that's maybe what everybody, we would all like to think that's what we're doing maybe. So I'm not sure that that goes very far as a point, but certainly the, 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 the key element of bringing this theoretical perspective, John has done this admirably, I think in this book, um, you have uh, sort of a general framework of world Englishes, uh, but you have the Marxist scholarship, you have, you know, world systems theory, uh, and then you have, you know, bringing this into to other theories of imperialism, empire, and post and uh, decolonialism. Um, I think it also. I think it also. I mean, this is a bit ambitious, maybe, you know, to think this, but it could be one of these books that, over time, will 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 be seen by people as the books that came out in the 1990s. That we had the book by Philipson on linguistic imperialism, and uh, Penny Cook and Kanagaraja's books on. Uh, sort of post-colonial takes on, on, on English in the world. And I, and I think it's, uh, this book kind of fits into that tradition. I'm not saying nothing's been written in between those books and this one that, that maybe also merits uh, some mention here, but, but I do think, I do see it in that way. It's a book, kind of go-to book because it is very, very detailed and, um, and, and it, it has, um, you know, it goes into great depth on things. And I remember when John was writing it also, there was, uh, um, first of all, the book proposal that he put in was 16 pages, and one of the reviewers actually said, "I've never seen a book proposal like this," you know, uh, and uh, in, a, in a positive way, I should say. Um, and um, and so, the, you know, once John got it started, I think he he uh, at one point we were joking that he was going to be like Marx, trying to write the six volumes of Capital, which of course were were never written, and he was writing reams and reams, and I would talk, you know, I have conversations with him and. I says, well, I've written, you know, 50,000 words, but it's only the beginning, you know, kind of thing. So, so as Lee Wei said, this is years, you know, this is three, you know, three or four years of really, you know, a lot of graft, really, you know, sort, sort of just reading, uh, you know, reading the, the, the sources and then, and then writing. Uh, and of course, that's what I see good scholarship as, as, as being about. And of course, finally, we have the, the, the product here, which is the, the book, uh, which has come out. And um, as I said at the beginning, I, I'm just just very happy that John has done, you know, has written this book. And, and as Lee Wei said, this is a great example of sort of critical scholarship applied to issues in, in applied linguistics. So um, as Lee Wei ended, I will end with saying congratulations and uh, thank you for writing the book, John. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And thank you, Lee Wei, too. Thanks very much, Lee Wei, and thanks, David, for that. Okay, so we, we'll move on then um, to, to the questions. I mean, John, it gives me huge pleasure as well to be able to talk to you about the book because, you know, we've, we, your office is just down the corridor from mine. We've talked about this book a lot over the years. Um, we've had, you know, agonizing conversations about things. I've read drafts of it or parts of it. Um, and it's just been wonderful to actually get the, the final product and, and, and to read it from beginning to end. And I have to say, I, it, it was an extremely enjoyable, if at times challenging experience. I mean, the book looks fantastic. It's got this wonderful picture of the Kraken on the front with all its tentacles. Um, and you've got these amazing endorsements on the back from you know, scholars like Pan Lee Ha and, and Alistair Pennycook, who says it's, it's a study of real importance, which I think it is, and which Lee Wei has said it is, and, and David as well. So it's, 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 you know, it's my honor to be able to talk to you about some of the themes that are in it. And I sort of thought we might begin really by, by something you said quite early on in the book, when you said that what you wanted to do in this book was to fill a historical and economic gap in the literature on the global spread of English. And I just wondered if you could begin by telling us a little bit about the nature of that gap um, and why you saw a need to fill it 
but also maybe if you could talk a little bit about why you adopt this very long durée um, perspective, because I mean, you go right back to, to the early 1600s at times and, and in your account of all of this. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the gap, why you felt we needed that gap filled, and then also what the need for this long durée was. Okay, well, thanks very much. And, uh, and, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, it, it has been indeed a long journey to, to get the book done, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for what everybody said. Um, yeah, the, the book is um, what I'd call a retroduction from a current state of affairs. Um, so if we look out at if we look out at the world and we look at English in the world, um, and we look at what you know kinds of Englishes there are in the world, what kinds of realizations of English there are in the world, what we notice is that there is, seems to be a kind of dominant form. There's a, there's a form that's dominant above all others. And really in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an approach that's um, retroductive, it, it asks, what, was the, what, what must the world be like? Um, what kinds of economic and historical processes need to be in place that in a world of diverse Englishes and diverse realizations of English, that it's the normative standard form, as I call it in the book, that is, the hegemonic form. Um, my answer, um, which the book documents, is that it must be a capitalist world system in which the hegemonic um, powers of that system um, but I don't have know. been world economies dominated by Anglophone nations during the last 400 years, in which the raison d'etre of the system is the endless accumulation of capital. So I was kind of looking at the current state of affairs and then saying, well, why is the current state of affairs this way? Um, why is it like that? Now, there have been many uh, histories written of the English language, um, of, you know, the origins of the English language through time, which cover a much longer time period uh, than my own. Um, but there have also been many um, you know, excellent volumes um, about the history of English in, in, in our field. There's also been histories of ELT. There have been, uh, been accounts of um, uh, English from a post-colonial perspective, as David said. There's also a huge historical literature on pigeons and creoles. And of course, we mustn't forget um, Robert Phillipson's seminal linguistic imperialism and books like um, Alistair Pennycook's The Cultural Politics of English and International Language, and the discourses of colonialism. Also authors like Masri and Mufweni and others who've written uh, on Africa. But when you look at um, these histories, except perhaps possibly for, for Robert Phillipson, they don't really deal in any direct way with uh, political economy or capitalism, uh, particularly capitalism, or indeed theorizations related to the evolution of capitalism uh, concerning capital accumulation, development theory, uh, and capitalist structural power. And um, these are the sorts of things I wanted to delve into as part of the book. And the other thing that they don't do is they, they don't tend to cover the, the range that I've covered in the book. It's a very deliberate range <laughs> from, from the 15th century through to the present day, because that's when capitalism begins. And so that's why I decided I would start there. Um, when you look at a lot of the literature, um, some of it takes what I would refer to, or, or others have referred to, as a presentist outlook um, mm -hmm. on, uh, on English in the world, um, concerning, for example, globalization processes, often since the 1990s, but some go back to uh, 1945. And yet, when I uh, think about capitalism, it is a long durée, and mm -hmm. I, I wanted, or a, you know, a long period, and the way in which English is established dates way before 1945. Mm -hmm. um, and that, in, that goes for the United States as well, whose rise to power begins in the 1870s. And it's really for the reason of wishing to capture this, this orientation, this evolution over 400 years that I adopted Fernand Brodel's uh, concept of the long durée. Okay, th thanks, John. I mean, I think that, 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 in, that what you're saying about presentism is something I think that we'll come back to maybe a little bit, a bit, a little bit later. But one of the things that I find really interesting ab about the book was the way in which you focus on um, a very particular kind of English, what you've just described to us as normative standard English, and um, really to the exclusion of other kinds of English and 
you're interested in its relation to, to capital and to capitalism as an expanding uh, world system. But I wonder if you could outline um, in a little more depth to us, what do you actually see the relation between um, capital and normative standard English as being? Um, and indeed, if you see any relation between non-normative um, um, varieties of English and capital. So just talking a little bit about that. Um, okay, uh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, in, in respect of uh, different perspectives coming from the academy and applied and sociolinguistics and uh, linguistic anthropology, there is a very clear preoccupation with uh, the dominance of English in the world, uh, and particularly uh, the dominance of native speaker models of English in the world. Um, there's been, as a response to this kind of dominance, there is um, a, 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 a general orientation to documenting um, non-conformity, non-conformity to these models, uh, along with rejecting the idea of correctness as residing with native speakers. Um, since people in the world evidently uh, use English in a very wide range of, of ways. Um, but by making correctness and the rejection of correctness the centerpiece of the critique, it's thereby made implicit that what's really being objected to is standard English, uh, at least in my view, and not how, for example, uh, native speakers in North Yorkshire, um, Belfast or um, Alabama use English, uh, because non-standardness is not something that is unusual in native speaker English, it's extremely common. Mm. Um, so when we look at the evolution of capitalism and the expansion of capitalism and the agents of that, of that expansion in, in Britain, for example, such as the East India Company, the English military establishment, foreign office, landed capital, manufacturing capital, financial capital, mm -hmm. at least from the 16th century through to the First World War, what we see is what we see is the class basis of that expansion. And from that, um, the relationship of capital to a normative standard English, what Gramsci refers to as a governing stratum whose mm -hmm. function is recognized and followed. Um, in the 17th century, it begins with the East India Company. In the 18th, it's the commercial revolution in England after 1688, with the founding of the Stock Exchange and the Bank of England. In the 19th century, it's encapsulated by something I refer to as Victorian gentlemanly capitalism. In the 20th century, this class link is so firmly established that it becomes the dominant default form of the whole system. Um, subsequently, uh, in, the, in the development of capitalism after 1919 uh, and after 19, 1945, this dominance is still further entrenched through a whole range of mechanisms, uh, such as um, the gold standard, um, monetary seniorage, debt development, the Marshall Plan, the Cold War, uh, debt crises, structural address, adjustment policies, the Bretton Woods settlement of the international financial, global financial system. Um, all these things come together um, to entrench the dominance of a particular form of English that is related to the circulation of capital. Now, you've asked me about the relationship of capital to um, non-standard forms. Mm. If we're talking about capital as commerce and finance, like capital in the economic market, then non-standard forms tend to have a secondary relationship to capital as compared to standard English. The, dem the demand for non-standard forms being um, that much lower. But that's not to say that there is no relation to capital because waged workers uh, in a, a capitalist economy using non-standard forms of English in the labor market do so in a multitude of contexts, um, most uh, obviously in the services industry. Um, and, but they're employed, they are employed for their ability to use English, uh, but even if non-standardly, but it's not a critical, uh, it's not critical for them to, to use the standard form. Um, but these are kind of non-elite contexts or contexts with low indexicality, non-standardness in English is, is, is also not, not uncommon in elite contexts and has been documented as such. 
where the medium is speech. Um, but where writing is concerned, and whenever capital is near or tangentially at stake, uh, this is much less usual. Um, there's also some forms of non-standardness which can have a high indexicality um, mm -hmm. or a high capital value economically, uh, such as uh, in music forms, um, hip hop, uh, rap, uh, this, these kinds of uh, musical genres in the uh, economic market of the music industry. And there you can find non-standard forms which, which have got a high indexicality in terms of capital. Yeah. But when you look at the global system, when you look at the, the, the world as a whole, you look at it as a, as a capitalist world system, what you find continually is the reproduction of normative standard English in all the uh, structures of the global capitalist uh, world economy. Yeah. And that's what you mean, you use the term free rider, you talk about English as a free rider on capital, is that what you mean by, by English as a free rider? That it's, it's sort of like parasitically um, attached to, or the, 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 the normative standard is parasitically attached to, to capital as it, as, it, uh, as it spreads. You could call it parasitic, you could also call it symbiotic, I refer to it as a symbiont as mm. well as a parasite on yeah. English. And of course, um, global capital over the last 400 years has been dominated by two currencies, mm. the British pound and the US dollar. Those have been the dominant currencies. Yeah. And uh, that gives those two um, world economies uh, and the nations that are ahead of those world economies uh, what's called um, uh, seniorage in the world financial system. So I've taken that concept of seniorage and, and effectively what you've got with, with, with English is a form of linguistic seniorage, which is associated with the uh, global dominance of these particular world economies over the past, uh, about the past 400 years. And that's why I've used um, I mean, you know, I very, obviously very deliberately went to Marx because who is the, the key theorist of capital in, in modern history? It is Marx. And his formulations of the circulation of capital are hugely illustrative. Whatever you think of Marx or Marxism, you can't deny that the way in which he has encapsulated the movement of capital um, in terms of money invested, uh, into the production of commodities, leading to an increment at the end, what's called MCM in uh, Das Kapital. And then financial capital is uh, indexed by MM. And I thought, well, with these formulations, you can, you can show how English is connected to these formulations and, and free rides upon yeah. them. Yeah. I mean, you sort of, you've, you've kind of preempted my next question or you've sort of segued into it. I, I, I mean, <clears throat> when you talk about, you know, you've talked about senior age, you've talked about things like finance capital, you've talked about, you know, the kind of formula, formulae that Marx uses in, in volume one of Capital, where he talks about MCM and CMC yeah. and the way in which you then add, add English on to that. And I, I, I mean, I find that very persuasive, actually, the way in which you did that. But it, it also made me think about our own field. Um, and the kind of reading that, that we do. Um, and I thought a lot of this might come across to some of your readers as maybe a little bit unfamiliar. Mm. Um, and I just wondered why, why you think um, our field has been, I mean, not, not exclusively, but perhaps in general, so averse to engaging with Marx. Sure. Um, I think you can also, uh, as I put it at the beginning, take a retroductive perspective on this. Um, there, it, it is. It goes without saying that. Uh, well, it should go without saying that. Um, for 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 the past century, since uh, since at least 1917 and the Russian Revolution, there's been a cultural demonization of Marx and Marxism throughout the whole of the 20th century and 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 right up uh, right up to this day. Um, and and this 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 cultural demonization can be documented from uh, from 1917 uh, through to um, the uh, rise of the USSR after 1945, um, um, North Korea, Vietnam, um, the Cold War period, um, the era of African independence, um, and what you find is that after World War II. 
the thinking of Marx only tends to survive in, in areas that are specifically dedicated to studying that kind of thinking, mm. uh, political theory, sociology, philosophy, some aspects of the humanities, such as uh, literary theory. But um, generally outside those areas, what you find is that in many other academic disciplines, scholars steered well clear of um, an explicit Marxism. And a very good example of that is M.A.K. Halliday, who wasn't able to do his doctoral thesis at, um, at, uh, at SOAS uh, because of his Marxist inclinations. But what's clear when you look at the work that uh, Halliday did on systemic functional linguistics, if you know your Marx, you can see the dialectic in, in systemic functional linguistics. You see the dialectic in the way in which Halliday has formulated his thinking around uh, systemic functional linguistics and the relationship between language and, and the real world that, it, that, that, is, that is around us. That's a that's kind of longer, longer background, but the shorter background is that with the collapse of the, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, um, Marx had, Marxism very much went out of fashion and the new kid on the block the new zeitgeist, zeitgeist of that inter intellectual age was not Marxism, it was post-structuralism and post-modernism. And it was really after 1991 and into the 2000s that post-structuralism really took hold in the academy, particularly, well, not particularly, not absolutely not particularly, but in our field, it certainly did as well. And there are some really significant texts um, I think of Alistair Pennycooks, for example, 2001 edition of Critical Applied Linguistics as being a, an exemplar and a seminal text in, in that area. But um, there was a lot of concern with the thinking of Foucault. Foucault uh, became really um, predominant in the academy and the social sciences, but many others also made, made their presence felt, people like Baudrillard, Derrida, Deleuze, Lyotard, um, and so on. They were all the rage. And this resulted in that 20 year period up until the um, global financial crisis, 2007, 2008. Yeah. Um, that 20 year period is very much marked in our field by a turn to uh, the, the social turn, the turn to discourse, the turn, um, this what's sometimes called uh, the, the, the linguistic turn. And, and it's this that really results in what becomes a really cultural and social linguistics. Uh, but as you've mentioned, there are exceptions. I've mentioned one, SFL, although its Marxism is not uh, worn openly, but it is there. But there is a, a, another field which I'm, uh, I, I'm known to be associate, associated with, which is critical discourse analysis, mm. which does actually have a much more explicit orientation to socialism yeah. uh, stroke Marxism. But of course, these um, areas predate uh, the 1990s. And um, that you can see the kind of change yeah. uh, between those, those fields and the fields that subsequently adopted a more post-structuralist orientation. I mean, I think you know, it's also interesting when you, you mentioned the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, I think it's shortly after that, that, that some of us began like in the Marx reading group at work to start thinking about <clears throat> the value of maybe looking at Marx again, um, because you know, the world had, as it, you had moved on significantly and, and there's suddenly many of us felt a need for um, a, 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 a more, something of a return to Marx as it were. Um, I, I've just finished reading um, uh, Richard Seymour's book, The Twittering Machine, and I was struck by much of what he had to say about how it seems to run counter to a lot of current theorizing about communication that's going on in our own field. Now, Seymour's not an applied linguist or a sociolinguist, socio but he is a Marxist. And one of the things that he suggests in the book is that we've become, he says, scripturient, um, which is, I think it, it's, it seems to indicate this kind of urge or necessity that we feel nowadays to write. And he says that human beings at the moment are, are swimming in writing and that we're writing more than we've ever done um, before. And of course, it's not only writing that we're doing, we're also reading the writing of other people. I mean, if I think about my own very limited use of Twitter, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm finding there are texts that other people have written and, and that they're circulating. But of course, much of this is written in what you have described as normative 
standard English. And I just wondered, you know, what do you think about, you know, so much of the work that's been done in our own field, um, in which language seems to be understood almost entirely in terms of speech and what you call in the book um, phonocentrism. And I just wonder what, what you think of that, um, that privileging of speech that seems to be going on and what we're, what we're missing by not looking at, at writing. Well, what I think is that, first of all, on Seymour, I haven't read the book, but I kind of I, I can kind of follow what he says by us living in a scripturient age. And I think, you know, what he's referring to, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, with the rise of social media, um, with the way in which email has taken over our lives, um, and of course, the rise of the Internet, um, people who engage with those platforms have to do an awful lot of writing. You have to spend all your time writing. But uh, the kinds of writing that's done in those kinds of platforms aren't always necessarily um, standard forms. I mean, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter is full of non-standardized English. It's full of it. Um, uh, and not just Twitter, but and indeed email as well. You'll find it there. Um, but these are fairly low stakes contexts or what Blomart would refer to as kind of low in debt, having low indexicality yeah. generally. Um, but you're right about the sharing. We share we share material online mm -hmm. and um, a lot of this is written in normative standard English. And a lot of the material that is online is in normative standard English. Part of that is because of uh, the orientation to the structural power of, uh, to, of, of English within what I called the knowledge structure in the book. The knowledge structure is saturated, the global knowledge structure is saturated in standard English. So when you find kind of, you know, intellectual pieces being shared or histories or whatever, or indeed if you read Wikipedia or whatever you read, you'll see that it's written in, in, in standard English. Um, on the question of phonocentrism, um, one of the things about the, the, the linguistic turn uh, in the 1990s and, and 2000s uh, towards post-structuralism is the thing about post-structuralism is that it, um, uh, it, it bends the practitioner to a focus upon local contexts, local practices, what real people are doing in real contexts with real language. And, um, and this is partly to do with the, the kind of post-structuralist understanding of, of, of reality, the world, and the relationship of us to truth and what we can actually really know. And therefore, what I, I don't mean, mean to generalize, but I, I feel it's kind of bending towards the local uh, and looking at, 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 at individuated uh, practices. Now, by doing that, there's, a, there's almost a natural necessity or a natural need to look at what people are doing. And when you look at what they are actually doing, they're not using standard English. People are using it in all kinds of ways. And in our field, it comes as no surprise that applied and sociolinguists and linguistic anthropologists are very much, and indeed world English scholars and English as a lingua franca scholars are very much interested in what people are actually doing with yeah. them. And I think that's why you get this orientation to phonocentrism. But as I have mentioned already, structural power of English and the normative standard in the world does not lie with speech. It lies with writing. Yeah. And I refer to um, I refer to writing as the speech of capital. Yeah. And that is where you that is where you get that that link. Okay, that, 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 that's really interesting. Um, I, I wonder then when you, when I think about, you know, all the sort of things that you group under the heading of super diverse translingualism, yeah? To what extent can, can this work and its attention to what has been described as the ordinariness of everyday resistance, to what extent can it actually challenge the injustices and the discrimination that many of those working in those areas um, are are keen to to to, to challenge. I mean, um, how, how can that challenge the kind of structures that you're talking about? Um, first, I'd say I'm really pleased that this work is being done. I'm really pleased that people are doing that kind of documentation of what people are doing with language, real people. Um, but I think we need to differentiate between the kinds of claims that are being made, or that if not being made explicitly, then implied. 
Uh, for example, if you take, um, I mean, the, the phrase superdiverse translingualism, I selected it simply to be able to include a range of perspectives which are not identical, but which have a lot of overlap or have a lot of co commonalities and overlapping elements. And they, they are translanguaging, translingualism, assemblages, world Englishes, uh, language commodification, English as a lingua franca. I, I put them all under, oh, and super diversity, of course. I put them all under uh, this heading. So if we take translanguaging, for example, and what kinds of claims that are being made, I mean, it's one thing to argue uh, for translanguaging as a pedagogic tool in education. Um, and another thing to argue that individuated acts of micro resistance to dominant forms have the potential to transform the underlying structures into the long term. Um, or that just kind of wanting this to happen or arguing for it in a rational way in, 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 in published outputs is actually going to make any difference to the underlying structures. And I think that the book, it, what I'm trying to, what I feel I was trying to do partly with the book is to bring forward the need to deal with structure. Structure is absolutely fundamental. Society precedes us. We come into society. Society can't exist without us. It is there thanks to our activity, but we, it, it already precedes us. And therefore, trying to kind of change structure is not going to be, in my view, particularly successful um, if the focus is on uh, what's sometimes referred to as micro resistances or individuated um, resistances towards dominant structures. Okay, okay. Um Right. Well, I'm going to ask you one. That's, that's very clear, John. Thanks for that. I'm just going to ask one final question, I think, before I hand it over to everyone else. Maybe it's a slightly perverse question, but as someone who is on the anti-capitalist left, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you think about the role of language in anti-capitalist political struggle. Now, Lord Lord, um, the African-American lesbian uh, feminist famously argued that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And it seems to me that that seems to be the position that many of the people um, whose work we've been talking about under that heading of of um, super diverse translingualism could be could be could be located. But I've always felt that, you know, if if the master has a sledgehammer and and you're able to get your hands on it um, well, it, it would be a shame not to not to make use of it. I mean, I just wondered to what extent um, you think that that normative standard English might have a role to play in anti-capitalist struggle and that perhaps our figuration of it as like the problem, that's what the problem is, normative standard English, might actually not also be in part a failure to, to recognize the problem of capitalism as the problem and, 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 and not necessarily normative standard English, which is free riding on it, if right. you see what I mean. Yeah, I definitely see what you mean. Um, on the on the question of 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 the way in which certain perspectives in our field, as it were, um, have wished to challenge normative standard English. Part of the problem, which I point to in the book, is that they do so in normative standard English. Um, so there's a kind of reproduction of the form uh, in arguing against the form. So this is a good example of people acting unconsciously to reproduce the system. Um, on the question of the use of, um, of, of normative standard English in order to rise up against the master's house, as, uh, as you put it, um, I've taken from, um, from, um, from Marx and Engels' German ideology, um, thanks to Raymond Williams, um, the notion of uh, language is a practical constitutive activity, or what Williams refers to as a dialectical practical consciousness, um, which is to say that language has its role in producing and shaping reality while also being um, shaped by it, which is very much in accord with a kind of Halliday'an understanding of, of the relationship between language and society. So, you know, language can have 
structural effects. And um, part of those structural effects are to be had through a political organization. And political organization, or indeed political organization leading to social transformation, will still need a lingua franca. Now, at the moment, uh, what the one that is most readily available, as it were, uh, is normative standard English. And so people can indeed use it because it's there ready-made and use that to uh, critique the system and to um, challenge the system. And so um, I don't, I, I agree with you that seeing it solely as the problem, seeing as it solely as the problem, the removal of which will solve all ills in the world is for me, as you've just said, to entirely ignore the problem of capitalism and of the endless accumulation on which that capitalism rests which brings me back to the point about structure again. Um, so that's, that's why the book is oriented in that way. Okay, Th thanks for that, John, that's really helpful. I think I, we, we should stop talking to one another and see if anyone else wants to ask a question. I'm just looking um, at the, uh, the, uh, the, the Q&A here. Um, I'm just going to see, I see, uh, a question from Gonzalo. Gonzalo says, thanks for such a fascinating talk. John, I wonder how you see the role of universities within the framework of capitalism and the role of English, especially when it comes to access to HE in the UK and English language requirements. Is this something that you cover in the book? And what would be your stance from a position as a critical applied linguist? Okay. Uh... Gonzalo, thank you very much uh, for your question. I do, uh, I do in passing uh, address um, the issues around, um, uh, around, around sort of language requirements for entrance into higher education through a section on um, language commodification in, uh, in chapter seven of the book. Um, clearly, these, these kinds of, um, these kinds of qualifications, these certifications, uh, these credentials, they, um, they're there to stand in for one's ability in English. Uh, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's the credential that you have that is effectively the commodity that you have. It's not that it stands in for your own competence in English, which you can't, which is inalienable. You can't, you can't separate it from yourself. Um, now, in terms of of entering the academy and studying within the academy. I think in higher education, it is, uh, it, is, it is regrettable that we have to rely on this billion dollar industry uh, in order that people can gain entry to knowledge in uh, the academy. And uh, this, is, this is clearly problematic. Um, I'm not sure I have the right answer for that. Uh, I think that um, we need to look at how we deal with uh, entry requirements uh, for uh, universities in uh, the Anglophone West. Uh, I certainly don't see the examinations that are available for students to take as being reflective of uh, what is needed in order to do uh, higher studies in, in, in a university context. Um, but I also think that, you know, there is a kind of way in which the academy produces knowledge and uh, in the Anglophone world, and that in order to be able to have your place and, and, and contest your place in that space, um, the kind of knowledge that you need to engage with does require a certain uh, level of, of competence. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be um, absolutely perfected. And in my own experience of, of doing um, uh, upgradings and PhD examinations and such like, there's a lot of tolerance and flexibility in our field, in our field. But when you go outside our discipline, you find that there can be a lot less tolerance for these things. So that's my response for now anyway. Okay, thanks, John, for that. I've got two direct questions to you, one from Jensen, 
um, and one from Paul Standish. Maybe um, you can ask both your questions. Jensen, do you want to go first? And then Paul, and then maybe John, you could answer um, you know, um, Jensen's question and Paul's. Jensen, do you want to ask your question? Jensen, are you there? Paul, do you want to ask your question while we're waiting for Jensen? Can be heard? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. 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 The, the controls didn't appear as normal, so maybe that's Jensen's problem. Okay. But the, the question I have relates to the notion of standard normative, normative standard English, which I would like to lean on slightly. None of this is to deny the interaction of our and a certain form of capitalism with the rise of English, which John tracked in the book. I think that there is something different that's emerged in the last 50 years related to the operation of power and the nature of this normative standard English. About 50 years ago, Malcolm Bradbury made the comment that world English was English as a second language. What he meant by that, I think in part, is that you, John, and I don't speak it. We don't speak it because our English extends from the most intellectual things we talk about, the language of politics, all the way down to the language of home and intimacy. That's not the case for the person whose first language is, is not English. The result of that, I think, that is that amongst speakers of world English, uh, the certain kind of normative standard of English is privileged, specifically language of technical reason. The reason this is privileged is because technical things are the most easy to translate or to see equivalences between language. Um, it's very easy to translate pieces of that kind. It's more difficult when you come to the more intimate. The consequence of this for all of us, uh, including people who are speaking in different languages as well in the global context, is that we are all thinking more in the terms of technical reason. It's not just capitalism with certain forms that's been privileged, it's the nature of technical reason. And I think this is damaging for our academic fields as well as for the world as a whole. I totally agree with that summary. Um, uh, I, 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 it makes me think of, of, of Habermas's notion of, you know, the, the, the distinction between uh, instrumental reason, which is what I think you're talking about there, Paul, and communicative reason or communicative rationality. And I do see the, um, the turn to instrumental reason as being um, particularly pronounced in, in, our, in our present era, uh, that the only, there are only certain true kinds of knowledge and that those true kinds of knowledge are the ones that are most instrumentally identified, the ones that can be most easily measured the ones that can be most easily tabulated and calculated and outputted and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the, uh, the, 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 the issues around um, that is that the knowledge structure, uh, which, which sits alongside the production structure, the financial structure, the military structure, in terms of the of structural power in a capitalist world system, the knowledge structure is highly instrumentalist. Uh, at the present time, and that instrumentalism is articulated primarily in normative standard English. So if you go to the uh, JSTOR archives at MIT, there are millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of um, publications in, in that archive, um, which are uh, instrumentalist. And if you look at the kind of language which they are using in order to articulate their instrumentalism, it is normative standard English. And that's because of its, its indelible link to, uh, to capital and the dominance of, uh, well, primarily the United States now uh, in the global knowledge structure. Thank you. May I just say that I wonder sometimes whether things are made worse by the fact that the language is English, which in part is susceptible to technicization than German is, I think, for example, or Japanese? Um, I think that, um, I think that that would, that would rec I am not sure that um, there would be um, widespread agreement on that in terms of different languages um, not being able to, to do that. I think there is um, a kind of 
adherence to technicism that has become associated with English without it necessarily being innate to English. And that any language, given the power that English has been given, can uh, and would develop that kind of technicism if it, uh, it were the language of, um, that had linguistic edge um, in the capitalist world system. At the moment, that language is English and it's normative standard English. Thank you. Okay, Paul, thank you for that. Jensen, are you still there? Do you still want to ask your question? Are you able to ask a question? Jensen, go ahead. Okay. Oh, he's left. Okay. okay. Um, I've got another question here for you, John, from Gosia. Um, Gosia wants to know how do you see the role of gender in the political economy of English in a capitalist world system, and in particular, white Anglophone men? <laughs> um, well, um, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, how do I see the role of gender and white Anglo-Saxon, and was that ac white Anglo-Saxon men? Anglophone, Anglophone. Ang sorry, Anglophone, white Anglophone men. Well, look, I'm not really, I'm not really sure of the subtext to your question, but what I will say is that um, uh, certainly in our world today, we have a, uh, a, um, a range of, of, of political interests. People have genuine, political interests which they are entitled to express. And uh, those interests um, cross a range of, uh, of diverse contexts. And one of those is gender. Um, others um, engage in environmentalism, others engage in, um, in different kinds of political activism. What I, what I do feel is that um, in respect of the way in which the capitalist system treats these different um, uh, political identities, uh, it, it, it effectively approaches them in a way that uh, divides them in order that the capitalist system can assimilate and accommodate them. And what I feel is that on, uh, in terms of political activism, we need a, a greater uh, coordination between our uh, difficult, dif different, and indeed difficult um, political interests, so that we can coordinate a more anti-systemic, a coordinated anti-systemic challenge, because capitalism has been extremely successful at assimilating anti-systemic movements um, over uh, over many many years, um, uh, and. And, and this is, it, it, I think this is one of the, one of the issues. As for Anglophone men, um, well, I'm one of them, uh, so I'm probably not qualified to comment. I think that uh, it's for others to comment on, on, on that, you know, on, 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 on me in that kind of, uh, on me and others like me uh, in, that, in, in that context. Okay, John, thanks for that. I've got a question here from Nicholas White. Um, Nicholas says, um, at what point from the late 15th century onwards do you see standard English as being established, especially as most accounts that Nicholas is aware of put standard English as appearing at the end of the 19th century? Um, uh, so it's really a sort of a long durée question, I think, about why you're, why you're going back to the 15th century. I'm going back to the 15th century because that is the beginning of the expansion of, uh, of British capitalism. The first expansion is into Ireland, uh, and um, the Irish language is over a, over a, a period of um, uh, a couple of centuries almost annihilated uh, in um, uh, in Ireland uh, through uh, linguistic genocide. I take your point about the kind of emergence of or consolidation, perhaps, of um, normative standard English. Um, but I would definitely go much earlier than the 19th century. But as I said at the beginning, I want to take a retroductive perspective. Where do you start with a retroductive perspective in understanding why the world is the way it is today? And I decided that I had to start with the beginning of capital expansion by the British. Now, the British did not have it 
all their own way through the uh, 16th and 17th century. But what you definitely do find is an expansion overseas, which is not matched by, by, by other nations. And with that capital expansion, you naturally get expansion of uh, speakers of that language. And so while um, Ireland uh, in the 15th century um, was primarily populated by people who did not speak English, it is from that time that the, um, uh, the, the birthing, as it were, of English, which then subsequently leads to almost the annihilation of English until the 19th century, uh, when it was revived, uh, sorry, the annihilation of Gaelic until it was um, revived in the 19th century. Um, and, and I think you just need to go and look at where these things begin. And, and what you find is that the, uh, the English East India Company is in East Asia uh, in the 1600s. And, um, and, and by 1750, they have established themselves in, um, in Canton. John, thanks. I've got two questions directly for you here because we've only got about five minutes left from Priscilla um, Alderson and from Robert Philipson. Priscilla, do you want to ask your question? And then when you've asked it, um, Robert, if you could ask your question and then John, you can take both questions together. Um, Priscilla, do you want to go ahead and speak? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. You've sparked off so many ideas. Um, and one is about how so much is reduced into words, into language. <clears throat> We're researching children's consent to heart surgery and how consent, which uh, involves very much profitable surgery, costly litigation, it's a legal contract between legal adults, all in words, and signified consent means signing the form, which children are not seen to do. However, our observations in the children's heart surgery units found that consent is understood very differently. Information is given through many media, play, interactions, role play, dolls, puppets, models. Um, and then signified consent is understood as the children actively resisting or actively cooperating with the procedures. And most of all, consent is um, a voluntary matter of trust, courage, commitment, an emotional matter. It's worthless without that. But we're finding that in critical realism terms, this epistemic fallacy of reducing everything into the epistemic, the word, um, the journals are rejecting our papers because the peer review system is another hegemony <laughs> that um, insists on certain very narrow regulations. I hope that's made sense because I've tried to compress lots of things very briefly. Thank you, Priscilla, for that. Robert, can you ask your question now and then John will deal with both of those, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you uh, both, John, uh, for lots of food for thought. I'm one, uh, the more I read Raymond Williams, the more I can see all sorts of reasons for going back to him. But I was wondering also how far you use linguistic capital in, in a Bourdieu sense, because to me, linguistic capital and its dispossession is as much a feature of the expansion of English, which can be resisted in my experience in some parts of continental Europe. But uh, how far have you integrated uh, this kind of uh, issue of the way linguistic capital both accumulates and also dispossesses, which is, of course, the David Harvey way of approaching uh, Bourdieu. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you very much for, for, for both questions, Priscilla and Robert. Um, on, on your question, Priscilla, um, what, what I can see is, is various layers of, 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 of meaning and interpretation in terms of engagement with children. I, what I can see is that it's not just the uh, explicit meaning that it is, 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 is part of what you're trying to do. It's, it's how we engage in different levels and layers of meaning um, and how we look beyond just what is on the surface, as it were, uh, and look at the, as you, put, as you put it, the signified event. Um, your experience of, of being rejected by journals uh, who, in, which insist upon, and I think this goes back to Paul's point, a kind of instrumentalist orientation 
to the way in which we construct knowledge in the academy um, and is therefore rejecting uh, your particular approach because it um, challenges their, their instrumentalism, it challenges their epistemic reductionism in ways which are, con uh, you know, are contrary to the way in which they understand the construction of knowledge. Um, and this is not your, you're not alone at all uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in what you are trying to do, because what we find in, in our field is that we have, we have a huge range of scholars, international scholars, who are trying to publish uh, through the medium uh, of English and finding that their work is being continually rejected because the, and I, I use the phrase that, uh, that Pan Li Ha um, gave in another talk, that, that the, 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 the journals, um, the journals have become a, like a sacred hall, a sacred hall where you cannot enter unless you are able to perform the knowledge uh, the, the, the knowledge demands, the knowledge structures, according to the way they wish you to perform it. And in, in our particular field, we're very concerned with, with English, English language, and you have to perform it in a certain kind of way. It tends to be in the normative standard kind of way. With regard to Robert's point, Robert, thank you very much for ans asking that question, because I do, in, in chapter one, uh, the, well, and through the book, uh, but in chapter one, I, I, I set out Marx's theory of primitive accumulation. I, um, uh, I, I, I link that um, to uh, linguistic capital dispossession. I, uh, I also very much foreground the connection between um, economic capital circulation as MCM and MM um, and um, symbolic power. Uh, as you have articulated it, and how um, how uh, capital accumulation and the endless accumulation of capital in a number of contexts leads to linguistic capital dispossession, uh, as you have argued in in, in many of of your uh, works. So that is there. Um, um, Bourdieu is, is certainly present. Harvey is present. You're present, and uh, so are so so are so are many others, uh, but my main focus has been um, um, the understanding of capital and capitalism uh, as it, it comes originally from, from Marx. John, I, I think we're kind of coming to the end, really. I mean, Jensen's question has appeared in, in the Q&A and it would be really good if you could take it um, before we're all thrown out of this Zoom, this Zoom meeting. Jensen asks, I wonder, he says, uh, uh, or the, uh, he, wonder, uh, he wonders, they say, um, how much do you interrogate um, with the issue of racism in your work, particularly racial capitalism? Decolonial scholars believe that racism and capitalism um, are inextricably linked. So any comments on that? Uh, racism and capitalism are inextricably linked. Um, the, um, the North Atlantic slave trade is one of the um, the key events of the of, of the seventeenth um, eighteenth century uh, is is that it is a cornerstone of um, of capitalist development, um, particularly uh, in respect of of, of the um, colonization and um, occupation and subjugation of, of East Africa. But um, uh, sorry, West Africa. But but not only but but not only there. So it's clearly part of capitalism. I do deal with it um, within the book when I discuss uh, when I when I discuss um, English language expansion in uh, in Africa, and I I, I do dis discuss directly um, the, the 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 slave trade and its contribution to capitalism and also why, um, why uh, the, the British uh, decided in the 19th century that it was no longer uh, um, profitable, as it were, to continue with the, um, with the North Atlantic States slave trade. And, um, and they, they then took it upon themselves to, um, to eradicate it. 
that was uh, that was the that was the plan within um, the world economy dominated by by Britain uh, at that time. Um, so I see them. I do see them as very much linked. I probably um, I probably don't have enough uh, knowledge of the full literature. I'm, I'm actually reading. Um, I'm reading into it now, and I want to learn more about it. Um, but I certainly do acknowledge it and recognize it uh, in the book. John, thank you very much for that. I think we're going to end here. I'd just like to thank everybody for, for coming to, to the launch and to thank those of you who, who asked questions or put questions in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A for John. And John, thank you again for for your, you know, your answers and for and for giving us this wonderful book that I that I think, you know, is, is, is such a great contribution to to the field. Um, I think David's absolutely right. I mean, this book is going to be up there with 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 Phillips in 1992 and Pennycook 1994 going forward. So it's 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 a wonderful um, contribution. And thank you again um, from all of us um, for for talking about your work um, so so eloquently. Um, okay, so thanks to Peter and Katie as well for, for being there and, and, and reassuring us that everything was working okay. And um, yeah, um, best wishes everybody, yeah. And thank you, John. And thank you everybody for being here. It's been such a pleasure to be with you and indeed an honor. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye everybody.